From November 21, 2011, the following is a living history debate on the future of the United States, hosted by the John Locke Foundation in Raleigh, and featuring Steve Holloway as John Adams and Bill Barker as Thomas Jefferson. Ken Ripley, editor of the Spring Hope Enterprise, moderates the debate. Speaking first is Corey Swanson, executive vice president of the John Locke Foundation. So, it's been a very fun, fun time for us at the John Locke Foundation. And this has become an annual event for us, and we've started this uh, maybe 15 years ago or so, and uh, recently we've started to do debates. One time we had Patrick Henry here with us, but one of our favorite persons to come with Thomas Jefferson is John Adams. And I think you'll really enjoy this performance tonight. Now the reason why <clears throat> that we have this program available to us is because of a very special person, a very special North Carolinian that you all need to know, and I'd like to bring out on stage Mr. Ken Ripley. <laughs> Ken is the publisher and editor of the Spring Hope Enterprise, and he's been doing that since the mid-1970s. Mm -hmm. Ken uh, was the one responsible for getting in contact with Bill Barker, who uh, plays Thomas Jefferson. And over the years, uh, he's developed mm -hmm. a very special relationship with these folks at Williamsburg. And every year, with the uh, assistance of the John Locke Foundation, Ken brings Mr. Jefferson and Mr. Adams down to work to not only do performances here with us, but also to do performances during the day and the next day as well with uh, school children throughout North Carolina, particularly in the eastern part of North Carolina. Today, for example, they've done two different uh, performances with school children. And over the years, they've been able to touch the lives of young men and women, thousands of young men and women. And really, it's a very special thing to have somebody like Ken Ripley with us. And I really would appreciate if you'd stand and give Ken a big round of applause. So ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I'm going to turn the program over to Mr. Ripley. You should never applaud until you hear it first. <laughs> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. History is not just a collection of dusty dates and cold facts. The founders of our country were not marble statues or saints. Our history was created by men and women just like us with fears and desires, passions and convictions, genius and prejudice, wants and needs common to every human being of every generation. And every generation, I am convinced, goes through times of questioning and doubt. Our country today is in such a time. We have come through a decade of two wars and a fight against terrorism. Our economy is in terrible shape. Many people are suffering as unemployment and poverty have risen. We struggle as a divided nation with important questions of religion, morality, and political vision. And our answers will define ourselves and our culture. What kind of nation is America? And what kind of people do we want to be? More than 200 years ago, in the early years of our nation, another generation asked those same questions of their time and culture. What kind of nation is America, and what kind of people do we want to be? For the next hour, a little more if you behave yourselves, I invite you to use your imagination and to go back with me to the end of the 18th century, in the early years of our country, as we hear two great members of that generation, Thomas Jefferson and John Adams, engage with me in an unscripted but freely flowing civil discussion on the issues of their day that also speak clearly to us in our momentous times. The format of our discussion begins and will conclude with short statements by our guests. As a member of the press, I will pose to them certain questions on topics they have agreed to consider. And after these questions have been answered, or time's up, they tend to filibuster, 
they are willing to entertain as many questions directly from you as time allows. So with your permission, then, allow me to introduce to you our guests for the evening. John Adams, a citizen of Massachusetts, is a graduate of Harvard College and a lawyer by profession. He served in the First and Second Continental Congress, where he became a fierce advocate of American independence, serving on the committee responsible for drafting the Declaration of Independence and earning for himself the nickname the Atlas of Independence. He later served his country as a diplomat, first in France and then Holland, then was part of the delegation that negotiated the Treaty of Paris that ended the Revolutionary War. He later became the first United States Minister to England. He returned home to become this country's first Vice President under President George Washington and under the new Constitution serving two terms. In 1796, as a member of the new Federalist Party, he narrowly defeated Thomas Jefferson by three votes in the Electoral College to become this nation's second president. Four years later, he lost to Mr. Jefferson in a very close bid for re-election. Thomas Jefferson of Virginia, a graduate of the College of William and Mary and also a lawyer and farmer, served in the Virginia House of Burgesses. He also served in the Continental Congress where he became known as the pen of the American Revolution when he wrote the Declaration of American Independence in 1776. He left Congress to become the first second governor of Virginia. Mr. Jefferson also served his country as Minister to France, as Secretary of State under President George Washington, as Vice President of the United States under President John Adams, and in 1800 became the third president of the United States. He was also, as he is proud to say, the author of the Virginia Statute for Religious Freedom and the father of the University of Virginia. Ladies and gentlemen, as they come in, let us welcome President John Adams and Thomas Jefferson. What's next? Good afternoon. Good evening, sir. How are you? Nice to see you this morning. How are you? Good evening. How are you? My pleasure. Evening, sir. Evening. How are you? My pleasure. Nice to see you. How are you, dear? Nice to see you. Nice to see you, sir. And how are you? Mr. Adams. Good to have you with us. Mr. Ripley, thank you for having me. Mr. Ripley, my honor. Thank my you. Honor, sir. Thank you. As we begin, Mr. Adams, would you care to make an opening statement? No. <laughs> anyway. I'd be happy to make an opening statement, Mr. Ripley. I just want to say how honored I am to be here with you today. I've had many honors in my life, um, and this will certainly be counted as one of them, and I hope it will be a productive evening for all of us, and I would like to express my <laughs> surprise and amazement that uh, Mr. Jefferson is here. <laughs> not seen each other for some time, and this should be interesting. Thank you. Equally surprised and amazed that you are here, Mr. Adams. I'm more delighted to say the both of us appear now before the people together uh, in the company of a member of the press, and recognizing how much has been printed about each of us, contrary perhaps to the facts and the truths, we have the opportunity this evening to provide. Uh, those realities in which we have engaged ourselves uh, in the formation of our nation and uh, through which we hope to continue the maintenance of this remarkable union. Uh, as Mr. Adams knows, I have frequently referred to our government as the world's best hope. And that, of course, we know is ultimately in your own hands. So having this opportunity to share the dais with these two gentlemen uh, and as well in your company, uh, I can see that hope is the more luminous this evening than when we would be not together. So thank you. Thank you. I thought you'd retired from politics, Mr. Jefferson. Well, it is easy to get you in the same room, and I do not tell either one of you the other is coming. But I do appreciate your willingness to come spend the evening with us. And I will start with an easy question, if there is such a thing. And actually, you raised it for me. Gentlemen, you were, were compatriots during the American Revolution. 
and served without animosity together under President George Washington. Uh, Mr. Jefferson, who even served for two a term under President, uh, as Vice President under President Adams. Yet, as you pointed out, you haven't spoken for several years, and I'm curious as to what is the cause of your estrangement. Well, Mr. Ripley, I, I must admit, and I believe Mr. Adams would agree, it was the device of politics uh, that came betwixt us. It was the result of the presidential election of 1800, uh, when we found ourselves standing in opposition once more to one and the other. Uh, we had beforehand uh, in the presidential election of 1796, uh, when, as you know, His Excellency General George Washington turned down the invitation uh, to stand for a third term. And we all know he could have been elected president for life. But he stood on principle, those principles upon which our nation has been founded. And therefore, we discovered with uh, his uh, denying the opportunity to stand once more that politics, just like nature, abhors a vacuum. All factions began to implode uh, as to who should be the next chief magistrate of our nation. Uh, the Federalists, who had occupied uh, the general public offices, uh, for a good 12 years, believed the government should go on and of by itself, uh, and whoever was vice president, quite naturally, should be the next president. Uh, I'm curious how many here of, are of that general opinion. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it is common sense that he who created us different in face and form created us different in mind. There will ever be an antithesis, there will ever be a difference of opinion, and therefore, as I had sought retirement, I was called out of my retirement by a difference of opinion. Those who had become known as the Anti-Federalists, uh, to stand in opposition uh, to my old friend, my fellow collaborator on our Declaration of American Independence, uh, Vice President Adams. Uh, and yet the result was simply that our nation was not yet ready for a change. We did not care to change the, uh, the administration as we had been secured. Uh, and yet, uh, having lost that election, uh, I then, well, as you know, our Constitution was written, whoever receives the second highest number of votes automatically becomes vice president. <laughs> if there were ever a fault in our Constitution, that is certainly the first and foremost of them. Uh, happily, as we know, it's been changed, uh, the 12th Amendment. However, as a result, I had to suffer uh, that office of vice president uh, for four, well, citizens. I have always said, perhaps some of you have read, that the mind of man never conceived a more useless office than that of vice president of the United States. <laughs> and so I did suffer, but as President Adams knows, I, I was not a, a silent vice president. I, I continued to proffer my opinions freely, uh, my opinion upon, upon the growing deficit of spending that our government was allowing, and my opinion upon this creation of a national bank, uh, my opinion upon our hostilities towards our former ally, France. And uh, therefore, uh, in the next four years, the presidential election, 1800, uh, saw the vice president of the United States in contention with his own president. We both stood opposed to one another once more, but we were not so, were we? Our nation was divided, divisive. Uh, your Federalist platform was divided by a Southern Federalist from South Carolina, General Pinckney. Uh, my own anti-Federalist platform was divided by, well, a former uh, Federalist from New York. Uh, he saw a political opportunity, and so he changed his party. As we say, uh, he became a renegade. He changed his coat. Do you know of whom I am referring? Uh, Aaron Burr, Colonel Burr. And uh, when the electors went to cast their votes that autumn of 1800, how well I presume we recall, it did not result in an immediate victory. It resulted rather in a tie, uh, not between President Adams and another. Indeed, you were not in the high number of votes. The, uh, the tie was between two opposed to President Adams, 73 electoral votes each for Colonel Burr and uh, Thomas Jefferson. And for many, many days, the United States of America did not know uh, who would be the next president. I dare say, Mr. Adams, could you ever imagine such a thing happening in our history again? Uh, <laughs> with an indecision in presidential election. But the point is, we followed our Constitution. It went into the House. Uh, we voted, uh, firstly, 33 times without breaking that tie, and yet there was engaged a collaborative effort uh, to compromise and, and reconcile the differences of political opinion. And therefore, uh, three ballots later, the 36th ballot, the 17th day of February, 1801, the tie was broken, 
and I became our nation's third chief magistrate. Now, the disagreements that had festered for some time uh, finally erupted in the recognition that the Federalists would only occupy uh, the majority of offices for only three more weeks, uh, or less than that, because Inauguration Day would be the 4th of March. And therefore, the Federalists supported, ushered quickly through Congress, the Federal Judiciary Act of 1801, creating 16 new federal judicial districts. And whom do you think they encouraged to appoint judges of the Federalist political opinion to these new benches? Referred to by my particular platform as the Midnight Appointments. President Adams appointed judges of the Federalist political opinion to these benches up to the midnight hour of his last day in office. That is what angered me. He knew that. I understand that you took the first stage out of Washington City, did you not? Half past four in the morning of, uh, of March the 4th. We have not corresponded with one another since, uh, nor have we seen one another until this moment. Am I wrong in the recognition of the politics that was played betwixt us? Quite wrong, Mr. Jefferson. Oh, very well. <coughs> politics betwixt us, indeed. You speak of Mr. Burr as a turncoat. I've always thought of Mr. Jefferson, certainly in years past, as not only a very close associate, but a very close friend. We did indeed serve together in the Congress that oversaw our separation from Great Britain. We did indeed serve together in the committee in which the Declaration of Independence was writ by Mr. Jefferson's hand. We both served abroad, both of us in France, in anticipation of their alliance with our new United States, and then after the war, he the ambassador to France and I the ambassador to the court of St. James, the first American ambassador to Great Britain. Neither one of us had anything to do with the composition of the Constitution. And upon our return, I was indeed honored, honored to be chosen as the first vice president for who else but George Washington could have been the first president the one who presided over the Constitutional Convention. When the mantle fell to me, my vice president chose to, for whatever reasons, to anonymously publish pamphlets and libels regarding my administration. That is the true cause of our initial disagreement. In regards to the so-called midnight appointments, I had tried to get those justices created for most of my entire term. It was not until towards the end of my term that Congress approved such. I appointed those of a like mind, as is my constitutional duty, Mr. Jefferson, and it is up to the Senate to approve them. That this was done underhanded, that this was done to usurp your presidency, is malicious, false, and untrue. And yes, indeed, I did leave before you were inaugurated, for indeed no president had been established as to how that would be conducted. I was no longer the president. The day, sir, was yours, and I willingly allowed you your moment, and I left without fanfare. Many would think that was a generous, generous action upon my part. Mr. Jefferson chooses to see in it malice and contempt. I have not brought up an idea of malice or, or uh, ill will. I brought up merely the devices of politics, sir. I never made a statement to a disagreement in our friendship. That remains deep in my affections, I can assure you. And if you care to allow this to be open to opinion, you have heard me say oft times, I never paid one cent to a news writer. Never paid one cent to a news writer. You either want to believe me upon that premise or you may take your own belief as you've accordingly expressed. And secondly, sir, I might remind you, the device of these midnight appointments was to stack, if you will, the new federal benches with those judges of Federalist political opinion. I ask you, sir, in fact, no, nay, I will not ask you, I will ask the people. Appointing judges based upon political opinion to the highest benches in our nation, is that justice? Sir, are you saying? No, citizens, it is politics. And if we are going to resort to that, as I have frequently said, and Mr. Adams has heard me, let us elect the judges to the highest bench. Then we can vote them off with every successive election. But that is not how it is styled in the Constitution, Mr. Jefferson. And are you telling me, sir, that were you in the same position, you would not have appointed Republicans? Absolutely not, sir. Oh, I would have appointed God. upon the basis of their knowledge of the law. 
their as experience they deny, in the sir, law. And the Not fact that they were Federalists proved they had a superior knowledge of the law. Mr. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Jefferson, you just said something that kind of puzzles me. You said you'd not you did not pay any news writers in your thing. No. But did you not hire Mr. James Callender of Richmond to do a Federalist newspaper? No, for you I time? did not hire Mr. Callender. Mr. Callender was hired by the uh, Democratical Republican platform, the Anti-Federalist uh, platform, uh, to place uh, articles in the newspaper that were not detrimental to Mr. Adams, mind you. Uh, these articles were based upon fact and truths that have been heard about clandestine affairs uh, engaged by our Secretary of the Treasury, General Alexander Hamilton. No, I did not hire Calendar. I supported him, but I did not hire him. Fine distinction, sir. Speaking of newspapers, gentlemen, you are both familiar, obviously, to the extent with which newspapers will go in provoking public comment. What has particularly angered each of you from what has been printed in the newspapers and do you think the newspapers have treated both of you fairly? Hmm. Hmm. Now we'll get out of the way. Ah. They've not treated either one of us fairly or justly. Both have taken advantage of the freedoms they perceive to be guaranteed them by the First Amendment to slander, malign, and to cause dissension betwixt the people and their government. I have been victimized of it. I have been accused of advocating monarchy. I have been accused of trying to drive our country into a war uh, on the side of the English against the French, when in fact it was to my every effort to avoid such. And Mr. Jefferson, the slanders against Mr. Jefferson are too numerous to, no, to name here. I, I leave you to name them, no, sir. Well, you know them far better than and, I. And you are correct, Mr. Adams. You are correct. I have been accused of being godless. Being, I have been accused of being a libertine. I have been accused of um, maintaining a Congo harem. I have been accused of, um, of uh, placing myself upon a lofty platform uh, above the common man, which it is thought uh, uh, I am therefore insincere in my support of the common man. Uh, you're correct, uh, Mr. Ripley. I believe Mr. Adams has expressed it well. We have both been uh, victims of the press. And yet, Mr. Adams, would you not uh, agree? Were it left to decide whether we should have this nation with a government and no newspapers, or have this nation with newspapers and no government? Well, I certainly would not hesitate a moment but to uh, accept the latter. After all, who must be the ultimate judge? The people. You're the ones to decide what you read in the newspapers. And who would ever want to satisfy themselves with reading one particular newspaper simply because it prints precisely what they want to read without acquainting themselves with the opposite opinion and then who must accordingly make up their own mind for what is best for whom? The people, the citizenry, our nation. So that is why I value newspapers. I value immediate information and I've always believed wherever the press is free, the people will be free. I agree with that. Mr. Adams, what do you think? In principle, I agree with that as well. In principle, I believe everyone should own a gun. <laughs> but I don't, do not imagine for a moment that your right to own a gun allows you to go out and misuse it, to commit crime, to commit mayhem. I would say the same is true for the First Amendment. The Alien and Sedition Act, I believe it's what you are referring to, was passed by Congress. It was the result of the will of the people, Mr. Jefferson. I signed it into law, as was my constitutional duty to do so, and I did have misgivings about it. But the fact remains that we were under assault from within, and we do swear to protect and defend the Constitution from all enemies, foreign and domestic, for the purpose of misleading the general population into distrusting their government to disrupt the government to disrupt my efforts to keep us out of war by lying and implying I was trying to get us into a war. And I do not believe that it is necessarily true that the First Amendment gives the right to foreign agents to use our free press against us with the intent of destroying our republic. And indeed, there was reason to believe that that was the intent of many at that time. That was the purpose of it. That was the reason for it. And of course, it was an act, and it, there was a sunset clause, and it was not perpetual. It was an emergency measure, 
uh, during a time which we considered uh, the situation to be uh, uh, dangerous for the Republic, and for that purpose, I did sign it into law. How many newspaper editors were imprisoned under that act? No, oh, I don't many. What, 15, 16, 17? There were 18 news writers, Mr. Ripley, that were arrested, fined $250 each, and thrown into jail for 18 month sentences. Their sentence would be over on the third day of March, 1801, one day before the presidential inauguration, thereby assuring the Federalist Party that they would have no overt opposition during the presidential election oh, of 18 months. that's nonsense, Jefferson, and I did not throw them into prison. The courts did. No, no, but you signed. President Adams, I the sedition law that was act, the result of the denying will of people, an American Jefferson. citizen their God-given right to proffer their opinion and print it as they choose in the newspapers, I do not imagine simply they have because the they had a difference of Republic. opinion with your administration. That's not true. It is precisely no, it the is truth. No, not true. It is the lies and malice that they were publishing about. Oh, so you conjure up their the, lies and malice, the conjuring up of fear it. at the same time to work the people all up with the idea of fear. The measure I ask was you, extremely citizens, dangerous, is Jefferson, fear tangible? And I can, can see you that. touch it? Absolutely not. If people are want to carry a banner of fear, then everyone thinks fear. Everyone is worried. Everyone fears that our nation is about to walk into a disaster. Into a disaster. For what? An undeclared war? Antagonisms towards our ally, France? France, good God. I dare say, citizens, reflect for a moment indeed. There was no reality during those moments. It was conjured up by the administration. And imagine those American citizens who had sought a solace and asylum here in this nation to escape ancient tumults and calumnies of European kingdoms thinking themselves safe, suddenly realized that our nation, in engaging conflict or war with the nation they had hailed from initially, thereby meant that they were no longer American citizens, that they must be deported. Jefferson, Recall those we aliens? were at war with France we upon the high seas. We most certainly were. We were defending our rights upon the high seas, as you did nobly during your presidency, sir. I was defending the right of open and free trade, As Mr. Adams, I. that we have a right to protect and defend our And we were being assailed by free. French frigates upon the high seas. It was an extraordinary time, a time that we were being tested by not our ally France, which was King Louis, but by a Republican France, which was never our ally. And they would only recognize us if we paid them bribes, the very foundation of government <laughs> corruption. And in this, this very incident was used by your newspapers, Jefferson, to imply that I was attempting to become a king and to establish a new alliance with Great Britain, for God's sakes, for the purpose of going to war with France. And because of this perception that was being fed to the people wrongly, I might add, all of our efforts to defend ourselves against the French were undermined. I declare, Mr. Ripley, did you hear as the people have heard tonight and as have I, France was never our ally, but a remarkable new historical fact. A lot of facts seem to be different tonight. Um, one thing I want to ask before I ask anything further, of those 18 editors, Mr. Jefferson, since you seem to know and Mr. Adams does not, how many of them were actually foreigners? Well, Calendar certainly was. Uh, he had come over uh, from England. Uh, there may have been one or two others that I believe were, were foreigners, yes, so the Sedition Act uh, was supported by the Alien Act at the same time. Uh, they could be of no offense to the present administration uh, so long they were serving their term in jail. And of course, perhaps, uh, that administration secured through the next presidential election, they would be of no offense uh, for being released from jail. They would have to begin their livelihood all over again after paying $250 as a fine. Well, 12 or 13 then were American citizens. Yes, well, the, yes, for the most part. And they were prosecuted under due process. They were tried in court. Well, they were convicted of violating the law, and they were put in jail. Well, Mr. Adams, when does honest dissent become sedition? In honest dissent is never sedition. All right, then why were they jailed? They weren't honest, it wasn't honest. They were liars. <laughs> Because they disagreed they, with your opinion? No, sir. They were liars because they were speaking statements which were untrue. By definition, lying. <laughs> I think I'm going to change the subject. So let's go to an easier subject, shall we? 
something a little less contentious. Congress is now bitterly divided between the two parties to the point that partisanship, with the help of the filibuster as a weapon of mass obstruction, makes it almost impossible to pass any major legislation no matter which party is in power. Do you believe our political union can thrive under or even endure such national divisions? When has Congress not been bitterly divided? Hmm. This I is agree with you there, Adams. When has it not been bitterly divided? Do you know I've always said, <coughs> recall, jealousy provides the energy for government. Really? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a showstopper. It is our belief, I, I think I speak for Jefferson here as well, it, it is the common belief, at least amongst those that I am associated with, that the federal government does not exist to intrude into the lives of every person every day. That's why state government exists, that's why the counties and shires have governments, <laughs> that's why towns have governments, and as a last resort, there is the federal government when all else fails. Uh, if an issue is so obviously important that we must, as a nation, act as one, then we will act as one. If we cannot bring ourselves to act as one, then obviously the issue is not perceived as being that important. I believe that uh, you would agree, Mr. Adams, that in the construction of our government, uh, we have provided a most unique mechanism for the government to become so preoccupied with itself in its divisiveness that whenever it comes to loggerheads and a stalemate, the nation continues on. That does not happen in a monarchy now, does it? With royal decree, the monarchy comes to a, a stalemate and to loggerheads as well. So I think the remarkable contrivance of our government allows for elasticity, if you will, in the progress that the people provide. In fact, the, the, I would not have supported two parties. We did not begin this thinking there were going to be two uh, organized factions that would perpetuate their existence, but it has provided an unintentional, intentional but marvelous check on the abuse of power. So you would think that a little gridlock is a good thing? I do, yes, I do think it is a good thing. Not that it should be tolerated very long, but. Uh, uh, absolutely. The opportunity for people to disagree and come to a, a stalemate, I think, is, uh, is innate in our, in our nature. It is not like the Parliament, Mr. Mr. Uh, uh, Ripley. It is not that you are a elected a member of Parliament to represent the realm. You are elected to Congress to represent a constituency. And if, as people, we are permitted to be different, and as groups, no doubt, we will be different, and various constituencies may have a great deal of disagreement in which their representatives in Congress ably represent their interests, hence gridlock. If there is something that occurs that is so important that these two different groups of people recognize the need to act, then action will be taken. If they are not satisfied with how they are represented in Congress, then those representatives will lose their seats which is why the state governments and the local governments are so important in carrying on the day-to-day -day business of preserving the rights of the people. Very well put, Adams. I, I certainly appreciate your outlook in that regard. Do you remember when we had discourse with Dr. Franklin upon the nature of our new government? Good and, God, which time? Well, many a time <laughs> indeed. This was in Paris and we reflected upon the viability of our Articles of Confederation. I thought them of a venerable fabric. They should not be tampered with. Uh, and yet, of course, the idea of a constitutional convention was already there. And uh, I recalled, I think we were in the midst of, uh, of Tourjol and Condorcet uh, there in Paris, and we reflected upon Aristotle's recognition of uh, human nature, the dichotomy of human nature, uh, that there are those who are born quite naturally to fear and be cautious, while there are those who are born quite naturally to, uh, to trust and have faith in one's fellow man. Uh, politics would thereby uh, take root and emanate. Uh, those who are cautious and fearful prefer strong and central governments. Uh, those, if you will, who are trusting and uh, open to collaborative efforts prefer that government that governs best by governing least. And here that reveals itself in our government to the extent that that we look to the people as the continual guide. That whenever the government may go too far in one direction, uh, who is called upon to come to the helm? If it goes too far in another direction as well, who is called upon to come to the helm? What a remarkable system of things. It, it never happens when we want it to, does it? 
<laughs> but it does follow this remarkable balance, very much attendant to the rhythms of nature, that put into its effect by the great architect of our universe. Our country is currently in a major recession, largely due to the collapse of home prices and growing numbers of foreclosures on homes from owners who cannot pay their loans. And the banks, in turn, have found themselves uh, in great difficulty. Leaders have argued, and Congress agreed, that the government should loan the bigger banks money to cover <laughs> the bad debt and keep their banks open, their doors open. Speculation in the stock market also caused financial mm -hmm. disaster uh, to investment companies, and the government was also asked to make them similar loans. Do you think the government should bail out particular industries to protect the public interest, or should the economy be allowed to run its course without government intervention? Mm -hmm. You know, it sounds like someone is still <laughs> very much at the works, even though he's been deceased some years. Hamilton. You know, Hamilton. Hamilton. <laughs> <laughs> Well, what is the source of your disagreement with Mr. Hamilton? My source of disagreement with, with General Hamilton? Well, it had always been upon the premise I just revealed uh, a short moment ago, uh, that element of human nature. Uh, I never considered uh, General Hamilton so wrong in his premise as it had been founded from time immemorial, that uh, great energy to the commerce of a nation uh, can be engaged through, uh, well, stock jobbing and, and speculation, yes, but more or less uh, uh, def deficits of spending. That was probably what saved our nation in drawing together the, the debts of those states that could not afford the, the uh, expenditure of the Revolutionary War. That assumption bill, though I was not in favor of it, uh, ultimately was compromised upon with the Residency Act. I think you recall uh, that during that near impasse in our Congress, uh, and one that President Washington could not even answer or judge, it was the most luminous mind I've ever known, the mighty little Madison, that suggested a compromise simply that as the South desired the nation's capital to be placed below the line drawn by Messrs. Mason and Dixon along a navigable waterway, and uh, as the North uh, desired the capital to be uh, in the center of commerce, such as New York or Philadelphia, that uh, if I might uh, influence the South to accept General Hamilton's assumption bill, uh, that then General Hamilton might influence the North to accept uh, the Residency Act by placing our nation uh, in the South, along the Potomac River. And so that compromise, would you disagree, Mr. Adams, I think saved our nation initially uh, from a great disparity. I would agree, Mr. Jefferson. And there you have it, Mr. Ripley, the, the idea of, um, of the deficit of spending began, and shortly after that, this idea of a national bank. I was opposed to that from the beginning as well. In fact, I can assure you there's absolutely nothing, is there, Adams, in our Constitution that even infers no, a national bank? Nothing. But remember that report that he drew up, the banking bill, good heavens, and the report of manufacturers and the like? It was so very, very complicated. <laughs> I remember saying and writing as well, I doubt even Hamilton understood it himself. But that was not the point. The point was the sale. Sell it. Sell it to Congress. And rem remember, citizens, who were the only ones who could afford it? There you have it to buy this banking bill, so to speak, and then who would appoint themselves the board of directors? And there, the direction of our nation was set in their hands, and in my opinion, out of the hands of the common man, particularly our nation's farmers. So there you have it, Mr. Ripley, my opinion upon the matter. What? I'm not sure you... I am not Would looking you... for your support upon my opinion, Adam. Well, let me I... ask in plain English. And I think I did not hear an answer to my particular question in there. If a segment of your economy is collapsing, should the government do something about yes, it? Yes, I leave that to you, Adams. Well, that was done. <laughs> <laughs> that was done at the end of the revolution, as Mr. Jefferson just said. Uh, the assumption, the bill, uh, the assuming of the state debts is proposed by Alexander Hamilton. Now, this other scenario that you project, I cannot comprehend. I cannot imagine that government should be able to be in any position to bail out any private corporation. I, I, 
Well, then I, I presume that... that in the United States, using your thrift and your natural talent, you may achieve whatever success nature permits it under the circumstances. I do not believe that there should be any check on whatever wealth you may acquire, but it's about winning and losing. If you win, glorious. If you lose, you lose. You are free to play the game. The government is not there to save you if you fall. <laughs> But Mr. Adams, I ask you this, would you uh, disagree? It is the element of government, it is the purpose of government, and the only purpose whatsoever, simply to protect the people from injury by one another. Otherwise, right. leave them free that they might pursue their own industry and their own improvement. Mr. Jefferson, I can imagine the economic state we were in after the revolution. Yes, the federal government took extraordinary steps which neither one of us necessarily approved of entirely. In principle, we were somewhat concerned by the power government was using to accomplish this noble end. I do not imagine, I cannot comprehend what Mr. Ripley is talking about. I cannot imagine anything more severe than debt after a war and the government taking steps to ensure that these bills would ultimately be paid. And yet, of course, remember the nature of, uh, of Daniel Shea's rebellion, that our noble veterans had returned from war, finding their cash boxes and their cupboards empty. How were they to renew their livelihood, provide for the sustenance of their family and their, well, their neighborhood? We, we have pensions, absolutely. There and are pensions, and there are, there are remedies in place. There is insurance, most assuredly. I'm and the script that the government provided. You recall that, the script to these farmers. And remember what happened with that script bought up at a premium, if you will, by stock jobbers and speculators, and then turned about and sold to another innocent body who had no idea that this that they were being provided was sold to them with the premium by the stock jobber, which had initially been issued by the government to our veteran. And then recall what ultimately happened, that no longer could any of the common man afford this script, being sold at such a premium, and yet who was benefiting and who was profiting by it? The government? Nay, those gentlemen under the buttonwood tree on Wall Street in New York. And recall what had to happen. Our government had to buy up all the script again at the premium they offered for it and then reissue it at its base price. Good old Wall Street. Sounds derivative to me. Um, let's go to something similar or at least related since I know you have issues with the Supreme Court, have had issues, a recent Supreme Court decision declared that corporations, which have long been considered a person for economic purposes, but corporations with their vast money and influence should have the same political rights as individuals when it comes to participating in the political process to support candidates or causes. Do you agree with that? Mr. Ripley, that, that is contrary to the basic principle of law that I understand. I, I, again, I cannot imagine what you were speaking of. Sir Edward Cook, Chief Justice of King's Bench under James I, who you studied, Mr. Jefferson, yes. wrote that a corporation has no soul. Therefore, you cannot sue it. Precisely. And therefore, what you are speaking about is the conjuring, is it not, of a corporate bodies, boards of directors, and no different, is it, Adams, than simply British mercantilism. Uh, the enforcement of the monopoly, say, of the East India Company, uh, the Royal African Company, uh, by the government itself. This, more than anything else, led to the riot in Boston Harbor back December of 1773. You know of what I'm referring to, citizens. And the teapot. Tea party, is that not quaint, Adams? I, 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 <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, in all honesty, Mr. Ripley, I'd have to read that Supreme Court decision because I find it incomprehensible. But I'm not saying that you are being dishonest, but I think perhaps you have mistaken it, for I cannot comprehend it. I wish I had. Uh, and that raises the question, um, relative to the judiciary and the overall question of the balancing of power in our new government, how far do you think that the authority of the Supreme Court should extend? And <laughs> For your question, well, what are the proper roles of the president's authority, whether related to courts or Congress? 
The role of the Supreme Court is defined by the Constitution. The Congress could, in fact, instruct the Supreme Court not to consider certain legal issues. They've not done so that I'm aware of, mm -hmm. nor should they ever do so. Uh, the role of the court, customarily, the role of any court, is to determine whether or not a particular law, act, or statute, or custom is being applied reasonably. Before we codified everything and introduced Article VI of the Constitution establishing written code as supreme, um, our system of common law, both statute and custom, had the weight of law if it was reasonable under established circumstances. Neither had the weight of law if unreasonable. What was carved in stone, where T's had to be crossed and I's had to be dotted, was the process that everyone had to go through. And certainly in, in, in tenure, you know, real estate, that, that very codified, at most certainly it is established. But in regards to an individual's act criminally, that is something else entirely. Um, the imperfection of someone should not be held against them. Someone breaks the law but has a good reason why he did it. That was arguably, it was pleading the general issue as it was called. Uh, yes, I did it, Your Honors, but this is why. And that would be acceptable. Um, consider that before the Revolution, uh, you, you know, there, we have prisons now. It's, it's, it's something new. We don't call them prisons. That's a nasty word. We call them penitentiaries. Yes, you it's know something who the Quakers have, have introduced. So you, you do penitence, you get closer to God. It's all nonsense. Anyway. Um, Adams, I had a great deal to do with the influence of a penitentiary Really, I'm system. not surprised, Mr. Jefferson. But you see, <laughs> uh, the penalty for any felony was death. Keep it simple. If you're convicted of a felony, the penalty is death. The vast majority of felony trials ended, if not acquittal, some kind of a pardon. For if you could plead your poverty or your circumstance and your crime was not violent, it was not reasonable that you should hang. So there were alternative punishments to death which were not codified. It could be uh, before the revolution you might end up in the Royal Navy as an alternative punishment to death. Something I thought the Continental Navy should have continued but they didn't. Um, you, you might have been transported, very popular in England. They can send you over here as a convict servant. If you were already here you might go from one colony to another colony, one county to another county as a, as a transported convict servant as opposed to hanging. Um, you might end up in prison, a public jail. But it was usually no longer than six months and you could not be sentenced to prison for longer than a year. Simply because you're in prison because you received mercy, the penalty for your crime was death. If what you did was not serious enough to justify hanging you, how can you be locked up for more than a year? So it was based on reason. Also, prior to the revolution, the wealthier you were, the higher placed you were, the more likely you would hang. In England in 1777, the Reverend Dr. William Dodd was executed for forgery. You see people pardoned for forgery all the time. Nobody gets hurt, no one's put in fear for their life, but he was an Anglican bishop. Don't you think he should have known better? The first use of a trapdoor gallows in England in 1760, the year George III came to the throne, was to execute a member of the House of Lords, Lord Ferris, for a crime not punishable by death. Lord Ferris actually killed one of his servants in a fit of rage. Didn't mean to kill him, no malice aforethought, so not generally defined as murder. He just lost his temper. Manslaughter is defined by statute as being a clergyable felony, which we no longer have. A clergyable felony is an offense for which, if convicted, you are entitled to mercy. You plead the benefit of clergy uh, for manslaughter, and M would be branded into the brawn of your left thumb, and they send you on your way. Had he killed a social equal, likely it would have been a manslaughter. He killed a social inferior. You're in the House of Lords. You're not convincing anyone you take servants seriously enough that you could have gotten that provoked. He's charged with murder, rightly so, and he was tried by the House of Lords. They sentenced him to death and they hanged him. I can't, I can't remember the point I was trying to make. <laughs> well, let's don't get hung but up on that. The point being is that the system was based not on written code, but what was deemed as reasonable. That's the point I wanted to make. I can't remember why. <laughs> the initial question was rele relevant to the influence of the Supreme oh, Court. Oh, have it there. Yes, thank you. The Supreme Court performs that function today. That was not written out, but that's the way courts have always operated prior to the Revolution. That is the purpose of a court. It's, it's separate from the legislature. Even though the legislature in our states appoint the justices, or the judges, as they are in many cases styled, 
but they're still separate. They're not beholden to the legislature. If they were, why call them a court? Just call them a judicial committee. The Supreme Court has that role in regards to the Constitution and federal law to decide under the circumstances, is this reasonable? In other and, words, is this Constitution? And yet at the same time, to remind themselves they are not seated on the high bench to create the law, to make law. No, 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 no. That no, that no. is where... No, no, well, yes. no, 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 no. Absolutely, absolutely. But when they say something is not lawful, they're not making a law. When they say something is not constitutional, they're not establishing a law. They're saying this law no longer exists. Uh, it should be this no law does not exist for you. It shouldn't apply necessarily to everyone. That is how the, the courts would have interpreted uh, prior to the revolution. But uh, we, we have to understand the definition of law. Our constitution is unique, uh, at least to English-speaking people. The Germans have constitutions. Well, of course they do. Um, the, 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 the Holy Roman Empire has a written constitution, the Bill of Rights. The various German states and principalities have the same. The British are talking about it. Yeah, the British are talking about it. God bless them. Um, but law, what we think of as law, began as custom. The word constitution comes from a Latin word meaning custom. Custom exists because it's reasonable. Why do you do it this way? Well, because we've always done it this way. Why? Well, it's reasonable. When circumstances change under which that custom existed, if we cherish the custom, we then codify it to preserve it. Um, to the, so the idea of the court saying this is no longer law, that's not the same thing as the making law. I presume that you were reading the papers during the time of the case being tried on the high bench uh, known as Marbury versus Madison. I may have perused it. Well, the point of the matter, as you per perhaps read, was the fact that William Marbury uh, well, did not receive his commission uh, signed by you uh, under the Federal uh, Judiciary Act of 1801. In fact, my Secretary of State, Mr. Madison, discovered the commission in one of the desk drawers in his office at the State Department building. He came to me and I said, this is a moot point, uh, Mr. Secretary, because uh, the law is being repealed. So this is no longer of any usefulness. Well, somehow, uh, Justice Marbury found out about it and uh, so he went to, uh, to Justice Marshall. And, uh, and that provided uh, Chief Justice Marshall, the opportunity to pursue this, uh, he wrote up an 11,000 word opinion citing writ demandamus, meaning that the commission has been signed, therefore it should be uh, delivered. The fact that it was not delivered is a crime. Well, I, my opinion, he knew well, after all, we both read law on the very, under the very same law teacher, uh, Mr. George Wythe in Williamsburg. We understood the elements of the law, and he understood thereby, with the law being repealed, this was no longer of any question. But what mattered was the fact that he was Chief Justice, that this was his 11,000 word opinion. By the way, it took him four hours to read on the high bench, and thereby providing what he considered to be a judicial review of the subject. Mr. Now, Jefferson, Adams, Sir Edward Cook gave us judicial review. Well, are that we to allow the judicial new. review to supersede the executive opinion or the legislative opinion? And if we do, Mr. Absolutely, Adams, would you Mr. agree Jefferson, that the we courts are, are supreme, Mr. Jefferson? Adams, if we allow the judiciary to assume this idea of judicial review, then we are allowing our Supreme Court to become like a core Mr. of miners Jefferson. and sappers who will one day undermine the foundation of our Constitution. Have you not read the Bill of Rights of your own state? Listen to the people, Adam. The Bill of Rights of Virginia in April, June of 1776, before this man completed our Declaration of Independence, stated very simply that though the justices are appointed by the legislature, they are separate to prevent the legislature from, legislature from being oppressive. So that no law could be made that violates the very basic concepts of what we consider right and free and just. Because legislatures have in the past done so. We know this for a fact. Mm -hmm. That is the fall of the Greek democracies. That is the fall of Rome. That is the fall of Great Britain, for God's sakes. Mm -hmm. There we are, Mr. Ripley. I remind you that it was President Adams who appointed John Marshall as Chief Justice. <laughs>
Well, let me ask a general question not related to the courts, but I think important as an overall discussion. Uh, what specific role do you believe the federal government should play in promoting the general welfare of its citizens, particularly in the areas of poverty, disease, education, and commerce? Promoting disease? I'm not sure I understand. <laughs> <laughs> the eradication of disease, Mr. Adams. Oh, and the sciences? Well, yes, Absolutely. the promotion of the sciences is in our Constitution. Most certainly it, it is. For the promoting of science. Uh, an individual is guaranteed in their, in their uh, talents, the promoting uh, of education. in their ideas. The promoting of the arts. Promoting of education, the promoting of the arts. Yes, it's that is the promoting the general welfare. Is and, of course, our defense. The Army, the Navy. Well, not that far. I, I, I'm not in favor of the promoting of an aggrandizing of, uh, of our defenses to the extent of a standing army. No, sir, but a standing navy eliminates the need of a standing army. I think militia boats are far more practical. Oh, militia Adams. boats, good God. <laughs> well, what do you all... Okay, Let's, you, you raised the subject of the military. Uh, you created a larger military forces uh, with some taxation to do so, though you did not have to use them. Uh, Mr. Jefferson, you have opposed large standing army or standing yes. armies, but you have used what you've been given. What do you consider the appropriate um, level of military force of strength in peacetime? And when do you think it should be exerted? The, the only appropriate military accommodations during times of peace are militias. They are those who are, who are stationed in order to protect and defend directly a, a particular vicinage, a county, uh, a state. Militia boats, and I would agree that I, I think that uh, uh, the defenses of our coastlines uh, is necessary. I think that would supersede uh, certainly a standing army, but not with any great frigate sailing up and down the coast of our nation. Tell me, Jefferson, how many militia boats did you send to Tripoli? Adams, that was a different concern. That was the defense safety of our trade, Adams. That was in order to protect our, our innocent voyagers across the ocean, in order to protect our merchant ships, particularly as they sailed through the Straits of Travolta. And, you and if you recall, Adams, may I remind you that when I returned from France, having very, become very well acquainted with the poshas and the days of these kingdoms of North Africa at the court of Louis XVI, I cautioned our young nation not to fall prey to paying tribute. Now recall, we had been the colonies of Britain, Britain paid the highest tribute, and when we became a new nation, that was still expected of us, that we pay this high tribute. And when I returned and cautioned Presidents uh, Washington and Adams that we should not allow our nation to be held in, as hostage or in such extortion, do you remember your reply? It is a small price to pay for the conduct of business. Well, it, well it may have been a small price to pay for those who could afford it, Adams, cheaper but it was a great price to pay for the average American businessman who has every right to conduct their business as they... opposed. I built the Navy that you used. Did I happen to make a flippant remark that it's a small price to pay? Yes, I did. Is that true? Yes, it is. Is the Navy more expensive? Absolutely. Do we need a Navy? Yes. And I had very little... J J President Washington had very little power or authority to take corrective action because there was no Navy. And I hardly think of six frigates as being an exorbitant expense in building a large Navy. I dare say, President Adams, if you had directed your energies to the utilizing of our Navy against the Barbary pirates rather than some undeclared war with our former ally France, then perhaps I would be more agreeable upon the subject. The French within but were a few weeks, us on the Barbary pirates. Within but a few weeks. We were weeks, defending our coast. On the 14th of May, the Kingdom of Tripoli tore down our flag from our embassy and declared war upon us, simply because I would not suffer to be coerced further and pay tribute, but ordered a retaliation against the Barbary pirates. And let me that the thereby first. was proclaimed an official war. In fact, President Adams, you, the Jefferson. first official war of our nation. You. I applaud you, and let me be the first. I wish that I had the Navy to do it, and I most certainly would, would have done it as well. But you are very right in doing so, and you use the Navy I built to do it, and for that, sir, you are welcome. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
Would you all either, would, would you all ever imagine a time where you would need or want to station American troops in foreign countries? And in fact, I can tell you, Mr. Ripley, that the success of that Tripolitan War rested in the fact that not only did the, the courage and the valor of Captain Stephen Decatur in, uh, in sailing stealthily into the harbor of Tripoli to, to seek fire to the, to the Philadelphia to set our, our sailors free was also uh, um, provided in the compatibility with the uh, dispatching of Marines. Uh, to march northward through the sands of Africa, accompanied with many mercenaries, and thereby defeat the Tripolitans uh, on the shores of Tripoli. With that accomplished, we were done with the war. There was no further need of imposing ourselves upon the kingdom of Tripoli, let alone the kingdom of Tunis, Algiers, or Morocco. We could conduct our trade, trade freely, Though uh, I think you've read, Adams, there has been concern with, uh, with Algiers and Morocco uh, and President Madison. The Islamic kingdoms just can't. In answer to your question, no. There's no, op there's no reason to occupy troops, although this was not an occupation. It was uh, an operation that was being conducted quite, uh, quite successfully. An excursion, yes, rather than a station. An invasion, if you will. We have time for one more subject before we need to um, open questions. Actually, we should start asking questions. But I just have to ask, uh, the issue of slavery <laughs> has continued to be a thorn in political discussion, and so I need to sally forth into another area. Mr. Jefferson, your own Commonwealth of Virginia is still devoted to the practice of slavery, and you personally own slaves. How do you reconcile the ownership of slaves with your public dedication to liberty and equality? And Mr. Adams, does the federal government hold the power to abolish slavery throughout the Union? You mean by declaration? No, of course not. By okay. de what, presidential decree? No, not necessarily. No. The Constitution protects the institution of slavery. The Constitution must be amended. I am in agreement with President Adams upon this point. Uh, there is no there is no reconciliation in purporting the innate liberties that are granted to the family man across this globe, not by any government nor ruler, but rather given to mankind by nature and nature's God, and thereby continue to, to hold slaves. Uh, yet no one can accuse me of being silent upon this subject. Uh, it did not begin when I was born or when my father, my grandfather, my great-grandfather. It has been our habit and our custom for many, many generations, and therefore the conundrum recognizing not only its immorality, but also its inconsistency uh, with the success of political economy to continue to support a system of labor when it grows well beyond 50% of the population is ultimately disastrous. But how do you end it? And we have made efforts to do so. Uh, as you know, my report on the Northwest Territories, uh, I authored in the spring of 1784. I presented it to Congress at that time. Congress was seated in Annapolis. And it was an effort in recognition of the land we now own to the Northwest as to how we might proceed to carve new states out of those uh, territories. I suggested five requisites. Firstly, uh, every territory becoming a state would forever remain a state of the Union. Secondly, every territory becoming a state would have its government in Republican forms, uh, as the other states and the federal government. Uh, thirdly, every territory becoming a state would have a portion of the national debt apportioned onto it as it could afford to pay. Therefore, no need for a national bank. A fourth, any person holding a hereditary title would not be admitted a citizen of the United States. And fifthly, to our general concern, Mr. Ripley, in your question, that uh, by the uh, 1800 of the Christian era, there shall no longer be any involuntary servitude in any of the states or the territories annexed to it. To them. Now, this was put up to vote uh, in Annapolis, and I presume the majority of you have read. Uh, it failed. It lost. But do you know it lost by one vote? It is still said the delegate from New Jersey was home ill that evening. I wrote in a correspondence shortly that on that date the heavens clouded over our nation and the destinies of unborn millions were made. I made the effort, Mr. Ripley. The report was not forgotten. It was altered to become the Northwest Ordinance of 1787, thereby declaring that our federal government would be responsible solely for creating 
new states out of the territories. That various states that had uh, conflicted with one another uh, over their so-called rightful territories to the west, for instance, Pennsylvania, and Virginia, Connecticut, New York, the Carolinas, would therefore uh, have to uh, deny uh, that, uh, that claim, and it would all be handled by the federal government. So you might well understand that an effort to end the spread of slavery, ultimately draw it into arrears, would be in the acquisition of over 830,000 square miles west of the Mississippi River. That which I have referred to as our new empire of liberty. Would that I could follow this by the release of my people. But unfortunately, as Mr. Adams well knows, anyone in public service is brought into arrears themselves. Only those who can afford it to be, can be elected to office, and yet at the same time, you leave office in debt. I'm now deeply in debt. And the Federalists well know my people are no longer my property. They're the property of my creditors. I hope not to sell a one in order to beat their demands. I hope in my retirement I may resuscitate the productivity of my farms. But I am hopeful as well that our nation might proceed forward and to warn the people in the devices of, of a national bank, the devices of stock jobbers and speculators as well that we discussed upon earlier in my final comment upon this matter. Whenever you spend money you do not have, you've enslaved yourselves to your creditor. Amen to that, sir. Do you have any other thoughts on slavery, sir? Jefferson has said it all. It is a shame that it was defeated by one vote. But in answer to your question, there can be no decree. The Constitution must be amended. So Congress could not pass a law that said no more slavery? It's protected in the Constitution. It's the protection of one's property. Mr. Ripley, that is in question. And may I remind you that neither one of us had anything to do with the writing of the Constitution. That's right. Disavow it when it gets uncomfortable. <laughs> um, I would like to um, now expose you to the mercies of our guests. Mm. If you have a question, raise it and we'll try to see you. Uh, stand and, and speak it clearly. Uh, but we welcome uh, questions at this time. This one. This was asked at a recent debate regarding, as a wage earner, how much money should I be allowed to keep in my own pocket versus how much should the government be able to take from me? Good God, they should take none of it. <laughs> In fact, an income tax is specifically denied in the Constitution. The Constitution would have to be amended to allow for an income tax, and you wouldn't let that happen, would you? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's indeed the, the point, and, and I, I think so. You would recognize as a wage, a wage earner. Well, you're rather in the minority, are you not? Uh, very, very few make a a wage in this nation as, as we know it. Very, very few live in one of the seven uh, large cities of our nation, those cities that are larger than 20,000 in population and uh, attend uh, to daily labors. Uh, most of our nation is resident uh, on farms. Uh, they make no wage, they continue to provide produce, uh, to sell that at the market and thereby receive remuneration. Uh, but regardless whether wage owner or one who uh, makes their livelihood as a farmer, uh, the ultimate responsibility in the management of your funds is in whose hands? There you are. I think, Mr. Adams, uh, that we should never forget the ingenuity of Secretary of the Treasury Albert Gallatin. Uh, as you know, I appointed him to uh, that, uh, that desk when I was president uh, to bring our nation's deficit uh, down. I, I attended to uh, the nation's government uh, there and the inauguration the 4th of March 1801 uh, with our nation 90 million dollars in arrears. 90 million. Phantasmagorical. Hard to not? imagine. 90 million. 90 million dollars. and yet lest we forget within the next eight years due to the devices of Secretary Gallatin uh, we brought that down and I left office the 4th of March 1809 uh, with our nation 900,000 dollars. 
uh, ahead, if you will, of the entire effort. Without that, taxing income. Without taxing, well, yes, of course, Adams. And <laughs> if, if, you, if you pronounce this too often, I think it might get in their heads. So I think you must leave it down. But the point of the matter is, Gallatin helped the people to understand that they are responsible. That the people are responsible. Citizens, our unique form of government is founded upon your approbation. The powers in our Constitution are powers that we have given our government. And 9 and 10 in our uh, Bill of Rights, of course, provide all that is not there is still in our hands. But ultimately, we are responsible. Our government is a reflection of who we are. So if we get used to spending money we do not have, take it as the status quo, well, then you will see that revered, uh, revealed in our government. So my point that Gallatin has made, printing this continuously in newspapers uh, for many, many years, he encouraged the people to practice three good principles of personal economy. Firstly, take care of your pennies, and your dollars will take care of themselves. Secondly, never spend money you do not have. And thirdly, do not purchase something simply because it is cheap. Therefore, when you see the others to go in arrears, when you see great calamities occur in political economy, at least you yourself, sir, even as wage owner, will remain solvent. Another question. Would you uh, care to comment, comment on the purpose of the Commerce Clause in our Constitution? And was it written to tell me as an individual what I can do or not do to buy this or not do this? Uh, for example, what I should do with my health? <laughs> what you the Commerce Clause extend to what you can do with your health? makes you healthier, sir, to be more prosperous in your business, well then so be it. Uh, or if you feel the healthier not to have such a burden upon your shoulder attending to your, your uh, counting house, well then so be it. The element, Adams, correct me if I'm wrong about commerce calls, is to provide a stability uh, amongst our various states, to provide a prosperity that will benefit all uh, in that regard. And uh, that there might be the regulation of our trade to be conducive to the uh, general uh, welfare of the people themselves. Uh, is that what you uh, recommend? That's how I would understand it. Yes, mm -hmm. Mr. Jefferson. Yes, but I'm curious about the element of health. I've always believed, sir, that the general health in our nation is in a deplorable state. I think we have become far too reliant upon the poisonous liquors, well beyond medicinal purposes. And the, well, no, Adams, we have discussed this, so therefore that is one of the reasons that I have become more promotional uh, in the cultivation, if you will, of wine. You know, sir, no nation is drunken where wine is readily available, nor is one sober where wine is dear. Uh, it is a necessity of life with me, let alone a panacea for ailments and conducive to good conversation. I'll drink to that. Health and the Commerce Clause. There's a new one, Adams. <laughs> Another question. You spoke very strongly against a tax on income. I wonder if you would speak to the idea, the notion of the federal government uh, taxing property. Well, yes. Well, yes. Of course, government taxes property. The government is there so that property can be protected, so that you pay for the protection. You don't tax income. In fact, Adams, if you remember, uh, when um, the uh, report on the Northwest Territories altered to become the, um, uh, the Northwest Ordinance of 17 and 87 found its way into our Constitution, uh, it stated that in the year 1808, at least uh, perhaps 20 years into the future then, uh, our nation's Congress would have the opportunity to vote whether we should continue the importation of slaves or to end that further importation. But within the 20 years, uh, during the time that slaves would still be allowed in, uh, to be imported into our nation, they would still be taxed $10 a head. That is a tax on property. Another question? Right there. Sir. My question to you, Mr. Jefferson, is uh, there's been some significant misinterpretation of your letters concerning the separation of church and state. Can you tell us what your real intent was for that? Because you know, we, we really want to know what you God did create this country and bless this country. And I don't believe that you know, the church should be separated from our state. 
Well, if you will, sir, I'm a bit confused. Um, we thought you know? we created it. <laughs> <laughs> Forgive me, I could not. No. <laughs> you thought, Adams. <laughs> I'm a bit confused, sir, as to how you might be knowledgeable of what I have written in my personal letters. <laughs> Already did the... Beg pardon? I'm <laughs> I worry about that as well, I can assure you. <laughs> sir, I can, I can assure you that, um, that during the presidential election of 1800, you may remember it was a device of the Federalist faction uh, to promote, particularly from the pulpits of churches in New England, the idea that if Jefferson is elected president, he will seek to burn all Bibles. And this was with the knowledge, of course, that, uh, that I was the author of the Statute of Virginia for religious freedom, uh, that uh, I continued to be seated on the vestry of St. Anne's Parish where I was baptized under the old regime. I've continued to be seated in order to help create what has become known as the American Episcopal Church. Uh, I have written the prayer for our nation in the Episcopal Prayer Book. I have been invited and as a consequence do sit on the board of directors of the American Bible Society. Well then why uh, this promotion of my irreligious attention? Well, of course, it was the device of politics and continues to be the device of politics. That is what I find to be abhorrent, because in my opinion, sir, it, uh, well, it is rather want to um, be a bit heretical. And we may be apt to forget the reason why Jesus threw the money lenders out of the temple. I'm very much opposed to politics in the pulpit and the pulpit in politics. The more so, when I arrived to my desk after my inauguration, found it flooded with correspondence from all of our nation's divines, worried whether they were still free to welcome their flock, preach the gospel as they should choose. And I wrote to each and every one, and particularly a Baptist preacher from Danbury, Connecticut, uh, in my letter to him to assuage his fears that the Congregationalists in Connecticut might disallow him to, to welcome his flock and to preach the gospel, I said, rest you assured that you are secure in that innate right to worship as you should choose, that all Americans are secure, more than man has ever been in his entire history, and that it is secured in our Constitution, which states clearly in the First Amendment that Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof thereby building a great wall of separation between church and state. Now, I'm concerned about the semantics, sir, that uh, you stood to suggest that I have written in my personal letters a separation of church and state. No, I have not, nor will I ever. Indeed, I am in favor of a separation between the civil authority and the ecclesiastical authorities thereby providing more freedom, more liberty to both of those efforts than has heretofore been known. More freedom to the civil authority to attend to its duty. As I pronounced earlier, President Adams agreed, the duty of government to protect us from injury by one another, otherwise to leave us free to pursue our own industry and our own improvement. And will not our improvement be the more successful when we are free to carry our communion with our maker as we choose. And consequently, more freedom for the ecclesiastical authorities to attend to their duty, the administration of the soul. No, sir, I am not in favor of a separation of church and state. For to me, that implies and could easily be utilized through political co conflict that I'm in favor of a separation of religion from our lives and from the lives of those we elect to government. Nay, sir, I've always believed wherever there is a freedom for religion, you will see the greatest civilizing of man. Another question? Even after today. 
can, can we see a time when we might renew, renew our friendship and become closer? Well, madam, I thank you for bringing that up because I think the time has, has arrived this evening. Uh, I've enjoyed uh, our old arguments and I have enjoyed uh, our agreements. Uh, I will never forget, with you, Adams, when we first met uh, there in the spring of 75 in Philadelphia City in the old uh, State House. And now referring to it, it's Independence Hall. Is that not quaint as well? <laughs> but we went, and no two gentlemen could have been more different. I stand six feet, nearly three inches, 190 pounds. Mr. Adams, uh, five feet and seven inches. <laughs> 190 pounds? <laughs> and... Uh, and realizing Mr. Adams representing the North, myself considered to represent the South of the factions in, the, in our former colonies, that we were able to draw those factions together in recognition of our mutual uh, failures for any redress of grievances, to recognize our mutual dedication to founding a new nation based upon principle, not upon monarchy, nor upon aristocracy. That is what brought us together. And it is quite natural within that lofty effort to have disagreements and differences of opinion. That we recognize as Americans we are more free than man has ever been to agree to disagree and yet never ever to deny compromise and resolution for the public good. Would you not agree, Mr. Adams, and I raise my glass to, to this principle upon which our nation has been founded, that as Americans we know a difference of opinion should never be a difference of principle. You can borrow mine for the moment. <laughs> We've got time for one more question. And I ask that you don't filibuster your answers. <laughs> My, my, favorite, my favorite writer, be it for philosophy or law, is Cicero. Mm, I do favor Cicero, Adam. That is my favorite. Who, who, who would you be, Locke? Well, no. <laughs> Locke, Locke is admirable. But. No, but he is, and, and, and I do favor him, not solely. I favor Cicero, I favor Aristotle, I favor uh, Bacon, and, and I favor uh, uh, Newton. Uh, but Cicero Adams, uh, why do you enjoy him? I enjoy him because of his respect for history. Uh, Cicero wrote that a people must never forget their history. That just as an individual should never forget their own personal history so that they might not suffer making the same mistakes they made in their past, that he reminded the people never to forget their history. Uh, for if they do, he wrote, uh, they will remain school children all their lives, uh, ready to be led rather than to lead themselves. But I dare say in this modern world of Locke, Newton, and Bacon are the foremost minds. I think amongst them, for me, sir, Locke remains foremost. You know, Adams, I've never gotten over the, the recognition it was an Englishman who provoked the American Revolution. John Locke. He did in his essays on government, volumes one and two, his essay on human understanding, his very simple message within that, that we are masters of our own destiny, but to recognize freedom is not free. It requires an eternal vigilance, and particularly to realize that no government anywhere at any time will long survive unless it recognizes it receives its just powers to govern from home. Yeah, you know, there's something to be said for Voltaire to... <laughs> Something Voltaire said, I think, that is appropriate. I may not agree with what you say, but I will defend to the death your right to say it. Mm. At this point, I would like I would like to thank our two presidents for coming. I must say it has been very pleasant for me to sit in to be calmed by the cool winds of disagreement.
So thank you very much for giving us your time this evening. And I thank all of you as good citizens for attending us tonight. Good night. God bless you. Godspeed. From November 21st, 2011, this has been a living history debate on the future of the United States, hosted by the John Locke Foundation in Raleigh, and featuring Steve Holloway as John Adams and Bill Barker as Thomas Jefferson. Moderating the debate was Ken Ripley, editor of the Spring Hope Enterprise.